Blog Talk Radio. Warning, the following program may include profane language, controversial viewpoints, and perspectives on the true nature of reality so far removed from the status quo, they'll make your head spin like a top. Young children, corporate executives, and religious fundamentalists should turn away now. Ow, planet Earth. Welcome to this edition of Extraordinary Year. I'm Tim Bravo. Thanks for joining us tonight. T-minus 58 days until, until December 21st, 2012. New energy. Free energy. Zero point energy. Ether energy. Vacuum energy. Tesla energy. These are all names for a type of technology and related science that in most cases draw on the limitless background energy of the universe. And this has been heavily suppressed by the powerful few who run this planet. Whatever you call it, our guest tonight is arguably one of the leading authorities on the topic. Joel Garbin is president of the New Energy Movement, a founding member of the New Energy Congress, and co-author of the book Breakthrough Power, How Quantum Leap Inventions Can Transform Our World. Uh, And Joel was also, with his co-author, Gene Manning, uh, the first guests ever on this program, uh, several weeks into the show, we actually decided to have some guests, and I thought that the most important thing we could possibly talk about was new energy. And so, Joel, thanks for coming back tonight and giving us an update. Oh, you're welcome, Tim. Thanks for bringing me on the show. So, for folks who weren't with us yet at the beginning of the year, uh, can, can you give us just a real quick Cliff's Notes idea of the genesis of this tech, where did this all come from? Well, you know, arguably the uh, the genesis of what we would call free energy technologies or new energy technologies really has has gone back several centuries, and uh, there's been a lot of uh, historical references to to inventors in Europe who were doing things with uh, magnetic forces, with electrical forces. But, but the figure who most people will recognize as the father of free energy is Nikola Tesla. And, uh, you know, what's been interesting to watch is just this tremendous resurgence of interest in Nikola Tesla's work. Uh, he is also uh, the inventor who took a lot of what Edison had discovered and improved upon it, made it practical, or produced other variants of those inventions to really transform our world, including the modern AC electric grid that we all take advantage of. And Tesla also had done some amazing things working on the wireless transmission of electricity. And that's something that could have powered our world with none of these these power poles and wires strung everywhere, uh, the electric jail, as uh, my mentor, uh, Dr. Brian O'Leary, would describe it. And uh, we would not have need for those wires everywhere if Tesla had had his way and if his work had been funded to the extent it deserved. Uh, but I think most people would point back to Tesla as far as the modern-day new energy inventions. And that would be former astronaut Dr. Brian O'Leary, right? Right, right. Uh, Brian O'Leary was trained in the Apollo program uh, in the 60s, and he actually had been selected by NASA because of Brian's study of uh, terraforming Mars. So there actually was consideration for a manned mission to Mars even back in the 60s. Uh, much of the, the programs for manned space flight got scrubbed through the Vietnam area, uh, or the Vietnam era, uh, Brian's program also was cut back. He ended up leaving the NASA program and went on to teach astrophysics in some of the Ivy League schools. But what uh, what really grabbed his interest was hearing some of these reports of anomalous energy devices that were producing what appeared to be excess energy. Uh, and these were reports that were coming from all over the world. And Brian used a lot of his uh, notoriety to make appointments with these inventors and uh, went, saw them, and was so convinced that these things were real in many cases that he started to write about them, lecture widely, and uh, actually very quickly found himself 
becoming, uh, let's just call it estranged from the mainstream academic world, uh, I don't think there was much appreciation uh, for these type of disruptive energy technologies uh, in mainstream academic science. Uh, and when of you say disruptive, you mean disruptive to the status quo. Exactly, Tim. Uh, you, you think about the trillions of dollars that are wrapped up in the current energy infrastructure with the fossil fuels, nuclear power, uh, and even now like the wind and solar, biofuels, what we would call the conventional renewables. I mean, it's a giant, giant economic engine, and it, it, it flows a lot of money into uh, quite a few pockets. And uh, you know some of the the largest material seats of power are funded by those fossil fuel profits. Well, you know something like what a lot of these new energy inventors are coming up with really, I think, stirs up a little bit of anxiety, more than a little bit of anxiety, in those who control the current energy infrastructure. Now, getting back to the genesis of everything, I'm glad that you started with Tesla. I think a lot of people who are interested in this topic are under the impression that these this technology that we have, a lot of the, it comes from UFOs, from extraterrestrial craft, that, such as the Roswell crash and, and stuff like that, that's been back-engineered. Now, there is some of that, right, to your knowledge? Well, I think it's fair to say that any advanced civilization that's learned how to traverse great distances in space, you know, you know, interstellar travel or across solar systems, they're not using fuels to do that the way we think of fuels. They're certainly not using chemical propellants. They're probably not using nuclear propellants. Uh, what they're tapping into most likely is energy sources that can be tapped anywhere in space-time, and that would include vacuum energy or what you call zero-point energy. And so any non-Earth cultures that have interacted with human civilization would be coming here with what would seem to be nothing short of magical propulsion and energy technology. So have we back-engineered that type of technology? I would say it's likely. I think anyone who scrutinizes the, the evidence that strongly suggests that there's been quite a bit of interaction between uh, cultures that are not terrestrial to this planet um, and with the human inhabitants here, I think they'd, they'd come away pretty convinced that Something's been going on. It's been going on for a very long time, and I, I think there's a tremendous body of evidence and credible testimony from a lot of people who've been in various military uh, intelligence community and military industrial projects. Uh, their testimony definitely suggests that this technology has been examined, re recovered, examined, and likely back-engineered, and that that's been going on for a very long time but withheld from the public and producing no social benefit despite the fact that it's probably to some large extent been taxpayer dollars that have funded these programs, perhaps um, illicit monies derived from various, uh, you know, black market trades. And, uh, you know, but we have not like seen the social the, benefit. Like some of the $35 billion in in unacknowledged projects just last year's budget alone. Yeah, those types of things, which the taxpayer generally are not aware of these things. Uh, you know, they, they if, if you saw that in some type of government document, you would think, well, that's just some type of accounting maneuver and, you know, move on to, to the next page of, of items that you recognize. But uh, there's all kinds of shifting of funds that that goes, you know, around the, that covert world there that, you know, citizens generally never even hear about. But really, the, you know, before 1947 and the Roswell crash and back engineering of UFO technology, we had Nikola Tesla, we had Wilhelm Reich, we had Walter Russell independently coming up with ideas that tapped into this zero point energy and, and came up with their own technologies kind of independent of each other well before any UFO or flying saucer was ever even in the mainstream knowledge. 
Right, right. Yeah, there's there's lots of very very uh, clever inventive people on this planet. It would be a real disservice to think that uh, that humans here on planet Earth are are incapable of coming up with with remarkable technological discoveries because it happens all the time in all fields of science. So, uh, you know, this is something that I believe is normal evolution on planets. I strongly believe that there are many, 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 many inhabited planets of, uh, you know, various levels of advancement. But I think it's part of the normal evolution for the civilizations that survive their uh, their technology uh, or survive unwise uses of their technology, um, and who who survive the barbaric periods uh, during their civilization's evolution. I think they do eventually get to the point where their technology is advanced enough to take them off their own planet. And I think that that's what would happen here too. But I think that there's there's probably a lot more. Um, a lot more interaction between, uh, you know, cultures on a, uh, you know, kind of on the uh, intersolar system level or, or you know, intergalactic level perhaps. There's a lot more travel that goes on than, than what people might realize. So there's influences, just like there's influences between nations. Uh, so you, you have a, you know, uh, going back to the 1400s, 1500s, you got... You know, Europeans who generally had some of the most advanced technology on the planet at that time, and when they would, you know, uh, take their ships and you know visit uh, a land where the the um, uh, inhabitants weren't quite as advanced, well, there generally were transfers of technology that happened there. If the uh, the the ones who were visited were able to survive the visit. I, mean, I think the same thing happens on a larger scale as well. Well, I'm glad you brought up the resurgence in Nikola Tesla and, and interest in Tesla. You know, one of the things that's happened, it's hit mainstream media from the Huffington Post to, I believe, even Fox News. Not that that's a real barometer for what should be paid attention to in our society, but the sale or the, the buying of Wardenclyffe, Tesla's New York facility, has is really got a lot of people's attention. There's a web cartoonist named Matthew Inman who goes by the name The Oatmeal, mm -hmm. who successfully raised $1.3 million on Indiegogo to help buy the facility and turn it into a Nikola Tesla museum. And mm -hmm. this is the fastest ever Indiegogo fundraising event. They reached 50% of their goal in the first day. Ultimately, it took just over a week. They were raising $100 per minute, donations pouring in from more than 100 countries. You know, what does this say about people's hunger for Tesla science and, and this technology? And, and, you know, even though we're not really talking about it in the mainstream, people seem to, to be clued in a little bit more than we might. Oh, think. I think, yeah. Yeah, Tim, I think it's a great barometer for how much people are starting to become aware of this field of potential new energy era and in some of the, uh, you know, the inventors that are honored, especially someone like Tesla. Uh, I think it, it it spells some really for us the fact that crowdfunding has been used like this. I, it's it's a great test case for using crowdfunding to go to actual tech, uh, technology development. So you know if inventors who have struggled for so long to be funded by uh, venture capital or government grants, things like that, if they were to tap into a crowdfunding source, uh, boy, wouldn't that be cool? You know, so everyone puts in, you know, five, ten, fifty dollars, and you get a few thousand people doing that. You know, next thing you know, you've got some real uh, cash that uh, can go toward development uh, in a big way instead of a lot of these these clever inventors uh, who are generally just working in small spaces uh, on their workbench or small lab. Uh, now all of a sudden they can they can do things in a much bigger and much faster way. Uh, so I just love this. I love this crowdfunding um, event that happened here to to get the Warden Cliff. Uh, facility in the hands of the uh, the Tesla Science Center. Let's talk about the top technology because I mean you are sort of at the uh, 
at the top of this field in as far as you really know what's going on, who's doing what, who's making moves, what the technology is. You do a lot of traveling and checking out technology. I know Sterling Allen, your colleague, has his Pure Energy Systems Network top five exotic energy systems. Would you name your top handful of promising technologies or devices and explain as best you can in layman's terms how each works. Sure. Well, I I think that, uh, you know, you, you mentioned about traveling around to see various inventors. This field has become so vast now. I mean, it has it has really ballooned over the last several years, and I credit a lot of that to uh, this successful awareness that sites like uh, PezWiki.com, Sterling Allen's site, he's done a great job in in providing uh, daily updates on what's going on in the field. Uh, he's a close colleague and friend, and and I. I can't congratulate him enough for uh, the fruits of what he's done and taking this on as essentially a new energy journalist. And then others like my co-author Gene Manning, who've been uh, in this field for, for decades, uh, reporting, writing on what's been going on behind the scenes with these inventors, uh, and others like Tom Vallone, and, and on and on. I mean, there's, uh, there's websites springing up all the time. There's thousands upon thousands of YouTube videos uh, you know, monthly now, um, the the field really is reaching some type of of critical mass where I think we're going to start seeing some of these uh, these devices start to really pop out in a way that uh, you know that have practical uses uh, rather than just proof of principle experiments. And you know, we're going to see some of these things now uh, start to really do something in our society. So. Um, you know, to think that any one of us has a great, you know, has a great handle on everything that's going on would, would be mistaken. But I think what we generally try to do as a, a practical matter is each of us try to focus on on a few, and they tend to be with with inventors who we've we've come to know, we've come to trust that they have technologies of merit, and and we we try to help bring resources to to those who we feel really uh, have something on the ball there. Uh, so I'll, I can speak to, to some of those that I'm familiar with. Um, you know, certainly I think the leading field right now is in the, the field of the low-energy nuclear reactions. Mm-hmm. Uh, cold fusion essentially is what the more household name for that would be. There's been a tremendous amount of research that has gone into this field. Uh, you know, it started back in, in 1989 with uh, the announcement of Fleshman and Pons, who were you know, two electrochemists at the University of Utah. And they made the announcement that, you know, they had done a, a fairly simple little electrolysis experiment uh, you know where they had a uh, you know a uh, palladium platinum palladium uh, electrodes that they experimented with in uh, heavy water you know run some current through them and you know normally you would just be you know splitting apart the the water into hydrogen and oxygen but they were noticing some really anomalous energy output from this in the form of heat and uh, they they studied this and they made an, an announcement that said hey we think we've we've discovered a new type of energy process and it it was called or labeled anyway cold fusion and it generated a tremendous amount of excitement worldwide uh, but it was very very promptly stomped on by the lords of science from some of the large mainstream academic institutions uh, such as MIT and Princeton and and others. Um, uh, You know, an announcement like this uh, where you had something that was a totally disruptive uh, process and disruptive now to the efforts of a lot of researchers in a lot of physics departments uh, at, at major universities and government labs all over the world, you know, this is something where the uh, the academic ego, I think, was getting quite stressed uh, because the the cold fusion announcement, if it proved to be real, would leapfrog a lot of the incremental type of research that had been going on. And there's, uh, you know, a lot of grant money that flows from corporations and from the government into a lot of university researchers. 
So it's not, uh, you know, it's not unreasonable to expect that that announcement, uh, you know, caused quite a bit of fear, uh, you know, in some of these more conventional circles. And, you know, the the hammer really came down on Fleshman and Pons. They were essentially blackballed from academic science and, uh, you know, pretty much exiled in a in, uh, manner of speaking uh, from the U.S. scene. And they essentially, you know, moved over to Europe to continue their research in a more quiet fashion. But a lot of of researchers worldwide picked up on those efforts and started to to do their own research, and it, it started to advance that field of cold fusion. And there's been a lot of variants that have come out of that uh, that go well beyond just those 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 simple electrolytic experiments uh, that Fleshman and Pons had had first looked at. So now we've got. Oh, geez, a number of different technologies uh, that are based on uh, either electrolysis or using principles of cavitation uh, to... Now, what's that? Because yeah. that's, okay. kind of, that's a different type of thing. That's using audio, right? Sound? Well, you can... You can uh, let, let me explain it this way here. So, what does cavitation mean? Cavitation means that you are creating essentially small uh, gas bubbles in a liquid through disturbance of that liquid with, with some other type of, of uh, energy, whether that, that energy might be mechanical action. For instance, let's say you have a boat and you have a, a, a boat with a, a motor that has a propeller on it. Uh, you know, when, you, when that, when that uh, 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 motor is turned on and that propeller is spinning very rapidly in the water, uh, you know, uh, you know what happens when all of a sudden you start to cavitate that propeller. You get an, an air pocket there and you just hear that, uh, you know, hear the propeller rev up. It essentially has created a void space in the water itself. But uh, under really highly mechanical, uh, high mechanical agitation like that, you can generate some very tiny little, little air bubbles that have very unique properties uh, that, uh, that actually when they implode, uh, and when, when those little bubbles implode very near the metal of the, the propeller, it, there's a very energetic reaction that can happen that can actually pit the metal. And so, so for for like naval vessels, uh, you know, for many years they studied, you know, uh, the the corrosion of the propellers that were used for naval vessels, and you know, so there's a whole, you know, uh, the science of of uh, you know the metal analysis, uh, you know, to try to understand, you know, the effects of cavitation bubbles on on the degradation of you know the surface of these propellers. And it happens, uh, you know, in systems that are vulnerable to water hammer, which, you know, when you, if you're hearing sometimes, uh, you know, you, you've got just the water pipes in your house, uh, you know, at a certain point, you, you might all of a sudden hear, sounds like something is slamming in the pipes. And it's, it's the entrainment of gas bubbles in the pipes. That's a cavitation reaction. Uh, and that can do a lot of damage to the pipes, not necessarily just through a lot of you know vigorous forceful shaking of the pipe but you can get a lot of these these small pits in in the metal structure itself and i'm going to explain where that that pitting comes from by describing a a type of energy process called sonofusion so in in sonofusion what happens is you have a small little little reactor where you have um, on one side of this this little reactor think about something the size of a of a man's wristwatch and so let's say one one face of that wristwatch you have a an ultrasonic frequency generator it's just a, a little piezo that when you you put an electrical current to that piezo it sends out an ultrasonic frequency into water that is inside that that little that little reactor vessel and then in that frequency it it disturbs the water molecules and it ends up 
creating these these little bubbles, these little gas bubbles in there. Well, if the, if the liquid that's in there is a, a form of water called deuterium or heavy water, which means that it's it's used it, it it's enriched with a form of hydrogen that is different than the the most common forms of of hydrogen that that comprise water. Uh, when you have heavy water, which is laden with deuterium, the the hydrogen that's in there isn't just a a proton, um, you know, and uh, uh, you know one electron. The nucleus there has a neutron uh, with the proton, and and when you have the the that little cavitation bubble that's been formed by the ultrasonic frequency, when that thing collapses just due to the pressure of the water around the gas bubble. It, it causes a very rapid heating of the gas in that bubble, and then when the bubble collapses, it, that gas shoots out at a very, very high velocity, you know, something on, on the order of 15,000 miles per hour. Yeah. And, and if, that, if, that little, if that little jet, and it's called a plasma jet, that little jet of hot, ionized deuterium gas goes into a metal uh, a metal target let's say it's a piece of foil uh, just a piece of metal foil when that jet implants into that metal foil you can actually get fusion of some of the these hydrogen atoms into helium atoms so uh, a particular inventor named Roger Stringham who's been a pioneer of the sonofusion process, he found that with, with his process, he was generating about 100 times more helium uh, in his process than what is uh, found in the background atmosphere. And that determination was made by one of the Department of Energy National Laboratories because there's very special instrumentation that's required to do that type of gas analysis. But what that extra helium was is it's the signature that there was nuclear fusion events that were happening in this this little sonofusion reactor so so hydrogen is getting converted to helium and when you have a fusion reaction like that occur an enormous amount of energy is released uh, in this case in the form of heat so what Roger Stram came up with was his little sonofusion reactor which produces about three times as much energy on the output side as is required um, of, uh, on the input side. So, so let's say he has 15 watts of electrical input to fire up his little uh, ultrasonic frequency generator. Well, he'll get about 40 to 45 watts of heat out of the process. So it's about a three to one. So these things you wouldn't just say are just high efficiency uh, energy devices. They, they are what is uh, commonly called an over unity energy process where the device is producing more apparent energy through the process than the amount of apparent input energy uh, that went into to start the process. Now, of course, uh, you know, the law of conservation of energy tells us that, you know, we're not creating energy through this process. And I agree with that. We aren't creating energy. But what we're doing is we are transforming uh, one type or maybe several types of energy into a usable form that's easily measured. So we can easily measure electrical current. We can e easily measure heat. We can easily measure light. But there, there can be some other energy inputs like the vacuum energy, the, the zero point energy, uh, perhaps some energy related to the magnetic field of the planet, uh, perhaps even gravitational uh, forces um, that we, we don't really know how to measure these very well. Uh, but it doesn't mean that they don't have real effects. It doesn't mean that they can't be uh, uh, coaxed into a transformation to a form of energy that we can readily measure and readily use. We use an awful lot of energy for heating water. And so a device like uh, Sonofusion technology uh, would have great, great application for us to have um, uh, the ability to be used in hot water heaters, 
uh, industrial processes that use boilers uh, to generate uh, electricity uh, because most of these power plants are burning something to heat water to make steam to turn a turbine to make electricity. So there's always heating water somewhere involved along the way there. So we got started on this thing about sonofusion, talking about cavitation and and cold fusion. So the sonofusion is one process that can be used to create these little these little bubbles by cavitating the water, um, and then you know it, it moves on and does some some seemingly magical things uh, you know through the other components of the device. Now, what about using magnetics? Uh, to create over unity devices because I know that's another popular way that people have been doing it what's what's the best technology along those lines that you've seen well there's been there's been a lot of claims on the uh, you know in the arena where inventors have been working on novel magnetic arrays some of those might be rotating magnetic arrays or, or what you might call a magnetic motor other might be solid state uh, magnetic arrays where there's no moving parts, but they're using a novel circuitry um, when with strategically placed magnets to, to create some type of, of novel effect. This has been a this has been a challenging field because a lot of inventors uh, who have believed that they have produced an over unity effect have have had their uh, had it later revealed that their measurements were in error or some of their assumptions were in error and uh, basically they were a bit deflated when they found that they really didn't have what they thought they have however there have been those I believe uh, strongly and my colleagues believe there have been devices that have been developed that do show a very real over unity effect with the magnetic motors uh, and with the solid state devices now now these would have a tremendous uh, impact on our society if these do make it out into the public domain especially sometime here soon uh, there's there's a uh, among my colleagues and I we have various relationships with inventors that that many of which are held in confidence as far as you know where they are in their uh, you know in their development process and you know what some of their plans are moving forward to uh, take the technology toward the commercial stage um, but there's there's some very promising things going on in that field um, I so would say the reasons the listeners have to be hopeful that any of this stuff might actually impact our lifetimes anytime soon. I do think that these are going to to happen soon. You know, one of the things as we were talking about the the cold fusion technology, uh, there's there's again a, a wide array of different platforms for using that technology. They they don't all look the same. Um, and uh, as uh, Roger Stringham, uh, who I mentioned earlier for the Sono Fusion, he had gone over to uh, well every year he attends the uh, the annual uh, uh, international conference on cold fusion, which this past August was held in South Korea. And Roger usually goes there as a presenter to give updates on his Sono Fusion process. And there's many other researchers who who present uh, what the, their latest findings are. And uh, one thing that Roger said was very exciting about this year was it was the first year where there was a very significant presence of financiers, uh, bankers, who were there looking to make deals with the researchers. And when you have it happening at that level, and these are international financiers doing this, when, when you're at that level, you know that now the science is considered real. It's no longer, you know, a bunch of, of maverick uh, inventors and researchers who are being held at arm's length and with nose pinched uh, by the mainstream saying, saying, oh, you're just, you know, your stuff is a bunch of junk science. That's no longer the case. 
any any mainstream researcher who who says that the cold fusion field is junk science now they are so out of touch with <laughs> what's been going on they're they're just being left behind uh you know as the uh, train goes racing down the tracks here because the the investment community does now recognize that this is a real field and they're starting to to put real money toward that which is a hugely encouraging sign and that's a, that's a very recent development so what's the state of suppression now then since because we know that this stuff has been you know the people have died trying to bring this stuff to the public what where are we with suppression now is that backed off well my sense of it and and this is, you know, from the standpoint of having a, a lot of relationships with inventors and, uh, you know, hearing a lot of their, uh, you know, their stories of, of various uh, suppression tactics that they've endured. My general sense, and I think my colleagues would agree with this, is that that seems to be lifting. Um, it seems like the, the the general consensus is that there are so many daisies popping up all over the world coming out of the the shops and workspaces of these various inventors and researchers that it's kind of like, hey, if you can't beat them, let's join them. So while we also feel that these that that there have been very robust and and powerful. Uh, new energy technologies that have been sequestered into uh, black budget programs for decades, at least, uh, that we where we have not seen a social benefit from those technologies. Uh, you know, we do feel that there's now a real opening for you know some of these uh, you know these these new developments that that are you know new will certainly sound new to the public that these things are now going to have a chance to start come out into the public domain. And I do think that some of these cold fusion technologies are likely to be on the leading edge of that wave. Um, you know, we see what's gone on in Europe with the announcements uh, and conferences held by a researcher named Andrea Rossi, who also has an interesting cold fusion variant where he is uh, using uh, powdered nickel together with hydrogen gas in a uh, a process that's heated up and then and then apparently yields a lot of of excess heat once the reaction gets going where where supposedly there's a a fusion that's occurring between some of the nickel and some of the hydrogen uh you know he's been getting a lot of attention and there's that, certainly a lot of a lot of holdouts in the uh you know in the research community who look at look at what he's doing who who think that that he's not credible and that uh and that it'll be borne out that 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 this guy is uh you know is full of it uh, but there's m just as many on the other side, if not more, who think that, whoa, there seems to be some fire under the smoke around what Rossi has announced. And uh, in, in large part because there are some third parties who claim to have done some test verifications and validations of the technology who are providing data uh, that's saying, hey, okay, there's, there is something going on here. Now, whether whether he turns out to be uh, someone who who leads this wave of new cold fusion devices into the the uh, the commercial domain or not, he has done a tremendous service in heightening the awareness of the whole field. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's there's some some researchers who are like, hey, he's going to be a black spot on this whole field. I totally disagree because there's been so much attention paid to what he's been doing. It's it's educated a lot of people about the field who otherwise wouldn't have paid attention at all. And that would be the ECAT technology? Exactly, Tim. Yeah, that's the ECAT technology. Well, you know, we can't talk about inventors who have garnered a lot of attention lately without bringing up Dr. Kesha and the Kesha Foundation and the announcements earlier this year that they were going to basically provide free energy technology, anti-grab technology, space travel type technology to the governments and scientists of the world in September 2012. 
Well, right. that was last month, and I myself, you know, I, I expected a big deal, and I haven't heard anything since. So I was wondering, A, what's your take, and what's the take of the New Energy Movement and the New Energy Congress on Dr. Kesha and his work? And what do you know about what supposedly took place last month? Well, that's a great question, and I'll tell you, this is probably the the, the third time I've been asked this uh, by various uh, media personalities in the last week. Um, what's going on with Cash? The way he he pronounces his own name is Cash. Okay. Uh, K e k k e s h e. It, it looks like Keshi, but apparently he says it Cash. But um, you know, I was talking to Sterling Allen at Pez Wiki about this even today about uh you know what do you what do you think about cash and um you know sterling had the opportunity to meet with him um within the last uh oh gosh it was about 6 weeks ago i believe um met with him over in europe during a, a trip that he made over there um, had a chance to to sit down and he he asked some very pointed questions at Cash about look you know you've made bold claims about having anti gravity technology having free energy technology about being able to manufacture water uh, you know these are all of course uh, total game changing technologies if they're real and these claims are extraordinarily bold to not just say you got one of them but to have you know, the whole suite of technologies. Uh, you know, so, you know, where where's the beef? <laughs> you know, show me something. Well, uh, he was not shown anything. Uh, and this, it was very disappointing, I know, to Sterling because, you know, he's been one who's been a, uh, you know, been producing a lot of, of uh, journalism around cash, uh, trying to to get, help get the word out that hey you know if, if this is something real we want you know the, the the mainstream audience to become aware of it because it's not the type of thing you'll see on CNN or on Fox News or you know in the New York Times or anything like that so you know we've all been strong proponents of this if he really has something to show but w- so far we have not seen anything now I, I am I, I have not met uh, the gentleman myself yet uh i i note when i read what he publishes he he clearly is very intelligent is very articulate um and uh, we may have the opportunity to get together in the netherlands uh, in a couple weeks uh there's a a conference that's being held in uh, just outside of amsterdam called the global breakthrough energy movement conference um, which is is being sponsored by uh, a great group of of Dutch uh, activists, and uh, you know this essentially is is going to be the inaugural conference of what you might call New Energy Movement Europe. And uh, while while we're over there, we're hoping to to get a chance to meet with Cash, get another update from him. But that's that's about as far as I know right now, Tim. Well, thanks for that. So, are you aware of this? New movie that's coming out Friday, Cloud Atlas. Uh, no, no, I'm not. Tell tell me what you've heard on that. Well, it's a uh, it's going to be a big blockbuster. It's from the makers of The Matrix, plus another. Director. There are actually three directors on this. It uh, takes place. It's based on a book by an author by the name of David Mitchell. The cast has it, it boasts people like Tom Hanks, Halle Berry, Hugo Weaving, Susan Sarandon, quite a few. People and uh, it basically takes place over many different lifetimes, six different lifetimes, and uh, it, the, the short story is. I mean, uh, it's going to be an epic, epic movie. It's probably going to be one of the most talked about movies of the year. But I just finished the book, and the most far flung future lifetime has a group called the Prescience. It's just it's a post apocalyptic world. Uh, ba- the story is based in what was Hawaii, and uh, the prescience come to Hawaii in an airship that is that is powered by cold fusion. And you know, the character uh, that Tom Hanks plays, Zachary, does ask how you know what makes the ship go, and it, the answer in the book is cold fusion. And so uh, I was just uh, curious if maybe you had heard that this movie was coming out and had any indication that there might be some sort of new energy 
uh, you know, an allusion to new energy technology in such a mainstream way? Well, you know, they say that that you know, the art art will reflect science, and I think the uh, you know Hollywood. Uh, you know, quite often will will pick up on themes in science, especially frontier science, and try to incorporate them, uh, you know, into the entertainment. So I think this sounds great. Uh, it's it's not surprising to me, you know, given what's you know all been going on in the cold fusion realm here of late. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny it, you you mention something like this. I remember uh, when the Incredibles came out. Uh, the you know animated feature, uh, uh-huh. what you know seven years ago or whatever. Remember the the villain in that one. You know he was he said he was using zero point energy. You know to uh, to power up all of his technology. Well, you know you you want to typically hear that, uh, but it just goes to show that you know Hollywood is paying attention. Uh, you know they're they're looking. I think they probably uh, read a lot more of the, the the type of stuff that you know comes out of organizations like ours and Sterling's and Tom Ballone's and things like that. Uh, you know they pay attention to to what's going on on the front here, and uh, because it makes for interesting uh, interesting stories. And uh, you know as this stuff starts to to come out, show itself as real. Uh, which we feel it is going to uh, eventually and hopefully sooner than later, um, you know, then they'll have been, hey, you know, they were the prophets, right? These were the the directors and producers who, who were prophetic. So it so sounds like got, fun. We've got all this great stuff on the cusp. You know, it sounds like there's a lot of hope that some new energy technologies will will hit the mainstream sometime soon. What can listeners do to kind of you know hasten that day. Well, I think I think there's a lot of lot of things that um, folks can do here. I mean, I, I would mention that the organization that I run, which is called New Energy Movement, and you can check it out at newenergymovement.org. You know, what we're all about is is education and advocacy. So we we educate the the public and policymakers and the in, investment community and the media about what's going on behind the scenes in breakthrough energy technology, and we we are very much call for a serious and urgent uh, support, you know, of the ones who are doing the research, including these inventors who aren't associated with big corporate labs or, or, or big research universities. I mean, there's tons of, of uh, hobbyist inventors, uh, very, very clever, uh, you, know, uh, you know, garage researchers who are doing, doing totally cool stuff um, because that's where, that's the hotbed of so much invention. It's always been that way. It's going to continue to be that way. Um, I mean, you think about who are the pioneers in uh, in computing, in personal computing and software. I mean, they were guys working, you know, in their in their garages. Um, and it's the same thing here in a lot of the free energy development. So, uh, you know, as part of that education, uh, you know, we also uh, try to motivate citizens to to get themselves educated to a certain level of proficiency um, on what's going on here. A great way to, to do that is by picking up a book or two on the on the field, uh, one that, that I and my co-author Gene Manning authored, which is called Breakthrough Power, uh, has become very, very popular because it, it's, it's written in a way that you don't have to have a technical degree to understand what's going on with this. It's definitely meant to uh, to point out to the non-technical public uh, what's going on, what the implications are for us, because we're all stakeholders in the outcome of how this thing plays out. Um, you know, and and beyond that. Uh, there's there's much that people can do as far as organizing events. Uh, you know, people can uh, volunteer to uh, you know to do any number of outreach programs, and we can, we can assist with that. Certainly, uh, well, we're we're an all volunteer organization ourselves, so we have no no paid staff. Uh, generally, we all have other day jobs that 
uh, provide the material support for our families. But yet there are definite expenses, you know, when you're trying to, to travel, see inventors, bring them, bring them some material support to, to uh, help give them a boost. Uh, so there's, you know, a number of ways that uh, the public donations that we receive help to spread the education and the advocacy for the inventors directly. I think that the crowdfunding concept is something that we're going to start to see a lot more of to to actually help to uh, fund some very targeted uh, development efforts from, from certain inventors. And I know that you guys at the New Energy Movement, uh, you guys support Thrive, and I know that Thrive supports New Energy in general, vice versa. So, um, you know, that's you, you mentioned getting together and organizing events. So I assume you're you're thinking about you know like the outreach type events you discussed to actually just kind of go out there and knock on doors or create an event to increase New Energy awareness. Is that what you meant? Yeah, I'll give you a couple of couple of examples here, Tim. Um, you know, one is uh, here a, a gentleman in Seattle just called me a couple of days ago and said, "Hey, uh, I, I want to uh, get together an event at our local library here. Um, I want to, you know, show people, um, you know, a movie. It might be a movie like Drive." Um, I'd like to have you come and speak about what New Energy Movement's about. Uh, and then they want to to uh, you know also have some type of regular uh, you know group meeting to maybe like feature a, a, a particular inventor or a particular technology and, and start to look at it, start to understand it. I've had others who have said, "Hey, look, um, I want to start a replicators group." Because uh, there was a, a shared interest in in you know being uh, uh, a a mechanical or electrical hobbyist uh, you know among a, a, a certain group of folks here in Portland, Oregon, where I live, and so that group became a very robust uh, replicators group. Uh, and then here, like I mentioned, the Breakthrough Energy Movement Conference that's going to be outside of Amsterdam in a few weeks. That was a, a few citizens there who feel like in, in their outlook on what's been going on on our planet, they felt like, hey, we've got to get involved in influencing the outcome. So they, they, they are now dedicated activists to helping get, getting the word out about new energy to the point where they've organized a conference and and they are bringing in speakers from around the world um, to to help you know uh, educate the audience there. They're going to live stream this, and and uh, you know they've sold out the conference. So there's a wide range of of ways to to get groups together uh, for these educational efforts, and and we encourage all of it. Um, there's some, a lot of student. Uh, related things that have been going on here lately. I'm, I'm routinely contacted by college students who are looking for ways to to start a club or, or do some type of event on the college campus. And that, that's just great. I love to see the young people getting involved. Yeah, that's really encouraging. And in all those different things you just described, I mean, that's really inspiring to hear that people are actually getting together, actually doing something. Oh, uh, hey, I, I, got, I got to tell you how exciting it was to to see the folks from from the Netherlands get together and contact us about their their aim to to plan a conference because this was uh, this was a vision that Brian O'Leary and I and a few other of the the founding members of New Energy Movement you know nearly ten years ago we we you know we we had the seeds of this idea to to educate the mainstream public about what's going on. And we had the vision that one day this was going to become a global movement, not just something, you know, here in the U.S. or in the Americas and Canada, you know, that's something that would definitely be global. And now to see this going on there, uh, you know, with, with this great group of activists there in the Amsterdam area, it, it's, it's just so exciting. I, I can't wait to get over there and start networking with everybody. Um, it's just going to be a great, great event. Yeah, and you guys, you, you've been pretty active lately. I know that you recently uh, did a, a stream teleconference or a, was a web conference to 
at least London and New York at the same time. How many cities was it? Was it four? Well, that's something that could be. Well, it, it was uh, for that. That was one of the evolver intensives, which is Daniel Pinchbeck's. Uh, uh, that's his his organization, and they do these webinars uh, that feature some type of provocative topic, and then they bring in a series of speakers. Uh, you know, one speaker for each week for for a certain number of weeks until they they cover the breadth of some particular topic of interest. So we just, uh, I participated as one of the speakers here on the Evolver Intensives uh, last week. And then actually tonight, uh, Nassim Haramain, another inventor uh, who lives in Kauai, and, and Nassim is a very, very, uh, has a very uh, strong following because of his work in uh, the, the physics field. Um, he was the speaker tonight, and uh, it was great to, great to hear what he had to say and get an update from him. As well, so yeah, there's been a lot of lot of events going on here recently. It seems. Yeah, you had mentioned. I hate to put you on the spot. But I, you had mentioned right before we hit air that um, you had just spoken with him. What what did you guys talk about tonight? Well, Nassim is a fascinating researcher, and you know he has uh, he has looked at the energy uh, scene from the standpoint of sacred geometry. Uh, from the standpoint of celestial mechanics, uh, from the standpoint of, of quantum mechanics, um, and uh, very, very multidisciplinary researcher. He's a self-taught physicist, uh, and he essentially has developed a, a uh, basically a set of equations that that provide some solutions to Einstein's, uh, you know, unified field theories. So it, it's, uh, it's amazing, and it's simple, and it's elegant. Uh, you know, we've all heard that maxim, as, a, as above, so below. Uh-huh. Nassim, Nassim's work demonstrates that through mathematics and direct observation. It's, it's remarkable. And, and to watch how he masterfully shows the, the sacred geometry interplay with the structure of our universe, uh, is, it's so awe-inspiring. And, and it's just beautiful. It's just beautiful. So uh, one of the other interests that he has is he, he does a lot of uh, direct observation of the sun. He has some instrumentations, special telescopes and things to directly observe the sun. So when we get together or when I have a chance, I'm always you know, eager to ask him, hey, you know, what's the latest you know, going on with our star here? You know, because uh, you know, I, I'm always looking up. <laughs> you know, and I, I'm always uh, you know, kind of watching the heavens myself and, and take note of... You know when there's uh, some announcements of uh, things celestial uh, in our solar system, uh, including uh, you know if the sun is is having you know any increased activity or or you know coronal mass ejections or, or any of these kind of That's things. The last couple and, days. And Nassim, Nassim always has an interesting commentary on that. So um, you know it, it's uh, uh, I think his take uh, here of late is that well. You know, we're actually the the sun seems to be in a fairly quiet period right now, at least here, very short term. Despite that, there's been some, you know, some uh, you know increased um, you know solar flare activity. We had a few you know large uh, CMEs that came off, uh, you know, within the last few months here. But but generally, it's been a bit quieter than what he was anticipating. Uh, but we talked a little bit about how. You know, our grid system still remains so highly vulnerable to any type of significant solar event. Um, you know, it, it, it has happened several times in the past where the grid uh, has been taken out in large parts of, of North America and Europe, uh, you know, from, you know, a, uh, an energetic uh, plume, you know, from the sun that, that struck the earth. Uh, and it will happen again. There's no doubt about it. The, the challenge is that we have become so digitized in our, uh, you know, the way we live, the way we work, and the way, you know, goods and services move now and communications so dependent on satellites and digital technology um, 
and a, a central grid system that, you know, any type of strong energetic pulse, whether it's coming from uh, from the sun or whether it's something that results from, uh, you know, some type of uh, sabotage, you know, could just have devastating effects on our society. And, and one of the, the things about moving toward decentralized new energy devices where we each would have our own personal energy device would would mean that we're no longer vulnerable to one centralized grid system uh you know being taken down by you know an act of nature or an act of sabotage that ends up crippling our society so uh you know anyway it's a, it's a topic that that I'm always interested in in broaching with Nassim when I have the chance well, that was a good point because I was going to ask you, you know, what what happens when free energy is reality and we each have, you know, each house has its own energy device and we're not on a grid that could, you know, spike. Um, and I guess you answered the question before I even got to ask it. Yeah, well, it doesn't it doesn't mean that even those devices would be invulnerable uh, because you know just like you know if we had a you know a, a big uh, you know, electromagnetic pulse that came as a result of, of a uh, coronal mass ejection that, that, you know, hit our atmosphere uh, as a direct hit, you know, it would take down a lot of things. I mean, it would take down the grid, but it would probably, you know, also, uh, you know, take down your laptop, take down your handheld device. Your uh, you car. Fry, could fry circuitry in your car, um, you know, your various uh, appliances in your home. I mean, there's a number of things uh, that that could be taken out by that, in- including a free energy device if we had those. But but there's there's ways of shielding devices and things like that that would make them less vulnerable. Um, you know, but, but the thing is, we would not be at the mercy of one large centralized uh, electrical distribution system that when it gets impacted, it takes out everybody at at once in a a fell swoop. Uh, You know, having distributed technologies uh, will be, give us a lot more, uh, you know, insulation from from having something like that happen. And there's, you know, there's energy technologies that where we, we don't have to be, you know, dependent on microcircuitry you know, as as well. So, uh, you know, some of the, uh, uh, oh, I, I'm not going to get into it, but there's there's other ways that we could handle, uh, you know, the energy uh, technology that doesn't all rely on things that would be vulnerable to magnetic pulses. So let's just put it that way. Well, Joel, I've kept you a little longer than, than I told you. Um, do you have any final messages, parting thoughts for listeners? You know, I think the 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 message I would want to leave is that you know we are living in remarkable times. the the uh, The name of your program, the extraordinary year, is very very fitting, Tim. And I'm so enthused to see not only people taking such a strong interest in new energy because it's definitely amping up now that interest and the number and the amount of activity in the inventor sector itself but uh, i'm extremely optimistic that we are going to weather you know these bumps you know that are that are in our path and there's going to be a few more um you know but i think we're going to weather that okay and and we're going to we're going to come out of this a lot stronger as uh, you know, as a nation and and as a, a civilization of a whole planetary culture, I believe. Uh, I think there's some some really amazing things on the horizon that that we really can't even uh, you know can't really foresee. But I definitely think that there's going to be a lot of, of of beauty and magic that that happens, uh, and we're all going to be really delighted that we had a front row seat. <laughs> There you have it. I'll take that kind of positive prognostication every day. Thanks a lot, Joel. Keep up with Joel at newenergymovement.org. Check out his book, uh, co-authored with Gene Manning, Breakthrough Power, How Quantum Leap New Energy Inventions Can Transform Our World. I've read it. I highly recommend it. Uh, Make sure you get the newly released second edition. You can get it on Kindle. I've got an Amazon link on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash extraordinary. Uh, So, Joel, thanks for taking the time and giving us this update tonight. Uh, Thank you, brother. Take care. You too, buddy. Okay, well, 
that would be the end of our show for the evening, except that yesterday morning I woke up to some, well, it was saddening news for me in that uh, I found out that Native American activist and actor Russell Means had passed away. Uh, and this is especially interesting considering that he had just kicked cancer's ass using holistic means and was doing just fine. Um, and then we talked about him last week on the show because he had come out with Oglala leaders and, uh, and, and in the company of other First Nations around the world to declare Lakota sovereignty um, from the United States, basically saying the Lakota were taking their land back. Um, that would be parts of five states, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, and Nebraska, and that they were going to issue their own passports and driver's licenses that people could live there if they wanted, then they wouldn't have to pay taxes. All they would have to do is renounce their United States citizenship. And a week later, Russell is dead. And uh, I, that makes me very sad. Like I told, I've told viewers on multiple occasions, I've read this man's autobiography. And when you read somebody's autobiography, you get a sense for who they are and you, you feel like you know them. And though I didn't get a chance to meet Russell, I do feel like I knew him um, through his work, through his writings, uh, even through his acting. Uh, folks will remember him as the last of the Mohicans in the movie, The Last of the Mohicans. He was also in uh, Natural Born Killers with Woody Harrelson. Um, uh, anyway, uh, he was very famous uh, early in the 70s as a part of the American Indian movement, AIM. Uh, people might remember that they took the Bureau of Indian Affairs building and laid siege to that in Washington, D.C., kind of trashed the place. They took Wounded Knee, and there was a months-long standoff and frequent shootouts with the what, the United States government there. Um, Russell was a very, he was a very positive, very spiritual, and very fearless individual. And so I wanted to take a second this evening to do a little bit of a tribute for Russell. Um, so I quickly tossed together a, uh, a little tribute, and instead of uh, talking about Russell all night, I'm just going to let Russell tell you a little bit about his views and his own wor words. So I'm going to play you uh, my tribute to Russell Means with a little flute music that is actually uh, just some improvisation I did at one point because I do play, play the Native American flute. Um, this is my tribute to Russell Means. <laughs> Beautiful. That's beautiful. Well, I, 
I love this land and I'm sad to say it's my duty as a Lakota to welcome human beings. So that's why I fight for this country. That's why I fight for the Constitution. That's because I see too many wounded knees. It's curious to me that Wherever they put us was full of energy from our grandmother's the earth. That's a thought you should think about. You might not like all of the Constitution, mainly because you've been brainwashed. But that's the only culture you have, and it comes from Indian law. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? The history of the Indian and the history of the American have now come full circle and were intertwined in the dictatorial policies of those that control the monetary system of America. And they have done such a bad job of it that they're destroying themselves. ludicrous at best and you allow it that's the crime you have no one to blame but yourself look in the mirror if you can't move and protect yourself and guess what happens look around you all one has to do is look at the results of history and that's proof of the pudding the empire of the United States has reached its zenith as all empires eventually do and they do it for the same reason too much military it sucks them dry and then they collapse from within and the United States is in the process of doing that right now if we have a misunderstanding the only way we can settle it is with the club that's the patriarch. The world over. Whether they're Asian, Middle Eastern, European, or in the Western Hemisphere, the patriarch still believes to this day that the only way to settle a misunderstanding is with the club. Albeit now it's a very sophisticated club. Club nevertheless. And the mentality is what I'm talking about. My God! They haven't come out of the cave! Mm. with their philosophy of life. Oh, it's just unbelievable, you know, what they've done to Iraq, what they're doing to Afghanistan. They don't understand tribal relationships, and that was in both Iraq and in Afghanistan. They have tribal relationships, which have their own mores and their own outlook, albeit they are patriarchal. Because look at the patriarch. All their religions and their governments are built the same. It's a pyramid with the man on top. Now, if matriarchy is a balanced society, then the pyramid of patriarchy means that it's unbalanced. You only have the male up there, the heterosexual male, in everything and all the structures of civilization. So that means they're unbalanced. As indigenous people, we're not arrogant people. We don't believe that the human being is the top of the food chain. We know we're the bottom of the food chain. And, and all we have to do is walk out into a forest and you find out real quick who's top of the food chain. Yeah. We know our grandmother of the earth lives. We know also that she's tired of us. Mm. She's tired of human being. And your patriarchal religions teach you that you have that right just to dominate and forget other things have life and deserve respect. Yeah? Like the leaves of the tree. The air is sacred. So they pollute everything and they mistreat everything, including each other. That's civilization, man. You're, uh... Your leaders 
I've forgotten all that about you. So welcome to the reservation. I could be a smart aleck and say, how does it feel? Because I know how it feels living on a reservation. Prisoner war camp. Because you see, when you're at the, at the top of a pyramid, whether you're a CEO, a president, or a king, or whatever, when you're on top of that pyramid, it's precarious up there because people are climbing up that pyramid. They want to take your place, and you know that. So the man at the top is fearful. That's why they have armies. That's why they have police. They're fearful. That's, that's fear. A society of fear. Think about it. A society that's upside down. It's insane to live in America now. And America is emptying out. They see the handwriting on the wall for America. And it isn't good. We'll take, I'm sorry to say, a revolution. And America has been through it before a couple times. Wow, what happened? What happened is you got saddled with Indian education. That's what that's how they educated us. They dumbed you down. They're dumbing you down. Yeah? So there's no value in, in education anymore. It's it's Indian education. That's why I call America the largest reservation in the world. Understand the patriarchal model of the pyramid. And you understand that as long as that pyramid exists, we have a duty. And you better get real. Not only physically, but of the heart, our spirit, our reason to live. Nah, you don't want the government taking care of you. I do not speak untruth. So America is no different than this Indian reservation. You're dependent on the government now, and you're getting what you deserve. But every time you try to get away from the government, they'll kill you. I'll put you in prison. Or let you become an American. <laughs> if you catch my drift. Because you're the new Indian. You're the new American Indian. Congratulations. Welcome to the club. Thank you, Russell, for being you. We'll miss you, brother. And thank you, listeners, for hanging out with us tonight. Still fleshing out next week's show. Two weeks from now, though, we will have near-death experiencer Melon Thomas Benedict. He has some specific messages from the light about the times that we're living in now. I think that's just about as appropriate as anything for a show called Extraordinary Year. We're going to talk about Melon Thomas's experiences in the light that have to do with the times we're living through now with Melon Thomas. So that's it for us tonight. Check us out at facebook.com slash extraordinary year. Please go like us, spread the word. Easy way to help others, you know, awaken and bring more light to this planet. You can follow me on Twitter at Tim Bravo, and we will close it. Keep your ear to the ground. Hold on tight, kids. Remember, do not be afraid. afraid. This is going to be an extraordinary year. Peace is on its way. Namaste.